to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is longtime listener, poet laureate, and Taya master, Anne-Marie Young. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And we have everything covered today. I mean, like, we have the entire spread of time zones covered. We covered <laughs> the evening, because Anne-Marie is in the UK in the evening, late evening, actually. And we have the afternoon, because it's the middle of the afternoon here in the US. And we have early in the morning, because our guest is connecting at early, early in the morning, about 6 AM. So we have the, we have all the time zones covered, right? <laughs> I don't care where you are in the world, you have no excuse. You have to be listening. It's very simple. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Our guest name is Denise Dealwork, Denise Dealwork, and she is um, an expert in grief, which is not the kind of thing that most people normally say. You know, I'm going to grow up and be a grief counselor when I wake up, or when when I grow up, rather. Uh, that's not usually on the, you know, that's not on the same um, uh, list of priorities that I'm going to be a fireman or I'm going to be a nurse. It doesn't quite really make the top ten. But for what she was telling us as we were getting started, this is actually a really, really big deal for her and has been for quite some time. She's going to tell us that story, and we'll learn about that. But Denise, first of all, thank you for joining us on the program at this very, very early hour. We appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for inviting me on and um, for giving me the opportunity to spread the importance and the urgency, really, of healing our grief and not being stuck in the pain and in the heartache. It's, um, it's an incredibly triggering subject. People don't want to speak about grief. But um, we have to, we have to face it head on and uh, move through it. The, the good news about grief is that you can move through it. As yes. far as I'm concerned, that's the best news of all. Yes. Because like you say, grief, not, none of us looks forward to that either. I mean, that's also not on, on the top 10 list when we're five years old. I want to look forward to being you know, grief stricken. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't quite work. But <laughs> nevertheless, we end up, we encounter it. We, we all encounter it at various points during our lives. And it's something we do have to work our way through. And, and it's also a key part of the spiritual side of what we like to talk about here on the show a lot, because you're going to go through life experiencing grief at various times. And it isn't something to be run away from. It's actually something to, to move through. And the goal really is to move through it easily rather than to be, to have the crap beaten out of you. Yeah. At least that's the way I, I look at it now. Now, yeah. if you had asked me 20 years ago, I would have given you an entirely different answer. But that's the way I look <laughs> at it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, uh, tell us your story. How did how did you end up, first of all, on a very unusual path like that? And uh, how did you uh, how did you come through at the other set, at the other end to uh, to do what you're doing? Well, in 2009, my husband um, died very suddenly of a blood clot, <clears throat> an aneurysm. He um, basically went to work and didn't come home. Mm. He collapsed at work, was rushed to hospital, and um, discovered that he had a spontaneous bleed in his spine, one in a mil million. You just, your spine doesn't bleed. And the end result of that was that he died of a blood clot. Uh, I wasn't with him at the time. We were living um, eight hours away. I was. We were living a rural, um, or should I say regional, Australia in Queensland. I'm in Queensland. Mm -hmm. And the closest hospital was in Brisbane, and that was an eight-hour drive. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't just hop on a plane. So um, I wasn't with him at the time because when he collapsed, he was actually flown by Royal Flying Doctor down to Brisbane to the biggest hospital. And I was driving up and down, up and down. And when he died, I, I wasn't with him. So you can imagine the guilt, the if onlys, why wasn't I there? Um, I could have seen it. Maybe I could have called the nurse or something. Um but I really, you know, sort of going through, I was completely numb. I was, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. And I started losing things. I started repeating myself. And my daughter said to me, Mom, you're getting Alzheimer's. At the time, I was only 51. Mm. But what I didn't realize is that because I was young, I didn't have other widows or people around me that had lost a husband. So I had no goalposts. It was just me trying to navigate this whole mess by myself on eight acres. We were on eight acres. And um, so I was isolated. I was on my own, which in hindsight was a good thing because it gave me time to actually reflect, to actually go down and to start feeling my emotions. 
Uh, I went for counseling. Uh, so a therapist didn't help. Didn't help me at all. It helped initially when I had needed to talk about it. But there came a time when I went, well, hang on, where am I here? I'm not feeling any better. I'm not getting any better. And that started my journey. That started my journey, my inner journey, going, well, hang on, I need to heal, not my grief. There are people who go through different uh, grief situations in different ways because we're all different human beings. Yeah. And there are there are some who experience it the way you do, the way you did, rather, that uh, it, it just drags on and on and on. Do you think there's anything that distinguishes the persons who end up finding the, the grief process to be long and extensive and, and almost uh, unending, unyielding from the rest of the population that tend to get over it a little bit faster? Absolutely. <clears throat> and that all comes down to um, resilience. How resilient are you? And um, I'm going to say something that some people might say it isn't, but staying in our grief is a choice. It really is a choice. You know, when my clients come and see me and I go, well, how long have you been in your grief journey? And they say, you know, some are only two weeks, some are five years. But there comes a time when you've got to actually face the fact and you've got to go, hang on, this is not living, this is surviving. And there comes the choice. <laughs> what am I going to do? Am I going to stay as the victim? Is it, you, we are a victim. I was the victim. And there's nothing wrong with being the victim. We have to be the victim because we have to feel sorry for ourselves. We have to be in that grief. We have to feel it. But we also need to move through it. We need to let it go. Not the grief, not, not the love, not the, not the person, but that, that overwhelming grief. We need to start letting that go. What's your opinion on why it is? And of course, this, this is going to be different from one person to the next, but I'm sure you have a, a sort of a broad perspective that would help. What, what's the reason most common or what are the reasons why people don't want to get through, why they, why they, they do hang on to it? Uh, what, I guess the way I would think about it is if you're, if you're experiencing grief and you're experiencing it on an ongoing basis, in kind of a perverse sense, there is a payoff that encourages you to keep doing that. Yeah. What's the payoff? The payoff is, first of all, the fear of forgetting about that person. Mm. So what's the fear that the payoff there is that if I forget about them, I'm going to, it's, it's just not going to happen. I, 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 all the memories are going to be long, a bit be gone. If I start being happy again, uh, what are people going to think of me? So the payoff is really just to put up a front and go, you know what, I'm, I'm coping. Look how strong I am. There's no strength in pretending and masking our grief. There really is no strength in that. That's a weakness. So there is, the, the, we think that, you know, I did it with my kids. I didn't want to show my children because they had lost a father. Mm -hmm. And um, I pretended I was okay. And, um, you know, mum's okay. If mum's fine, how are you doing? What are you doing? How was your day? Um, and then I started getting resentful because they weren't asking me the same thing. Why aren't they, why aren't they asking me how I am? Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I've lost my husband. Mm -hmm. But we grieve differently. Mm -hmm. I lost my husband. I, lo I lost my life partner. They lost a dad. They lost a father. That's a different grief. Sure. So that's why people stay stuck is because they don't, they don't acknowledge that, hang on, I am allowed to be happy. I am allowed to, to, to have a life. And in fact, you, by not doing that, you're not living your loved one's legacy. I'm reminded of what happened when my father died. My father was uh, almost 11 years older than my mother. And he died at age 89 back in 2008. And when he passed, um, I remember asking my mom probably six to months, six to eight months later, how she was doing, how she was hanging in. And, uh, she gave me an answer kind of similar to what you said. I'm fine. Everything's great. All that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I could tell it wasn't true. Yeah. I mean, we all could. My brother, my sister and I, we all could tell. 
it was you, you didn't have to be a, a, a psychoanalyst in order to figure that out. It was pretty straightforward. But nevertheless, she didn't see it that way. And and she was pretty clear on no, no, no I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, my my ex wife uh, is a or, or at that point was a psychotherapist and recognized the symptoms and was able to, in a very caring way to confront her on, you know, you're not really over this yet. And she resisted it at first, but yeah. within about a week after my ex had the, the, the conversation with her, she's, she said, yeah, you're right. I, I, I've just been kind of burying this. I hadn't really, mm -hmm. I, I thought I was past it, but I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and I, I think that's a fairly common kind of response in the sense that many of us, most of us don't, we don't want to be in that grief place. So we come out the other side. I mean, I, well, I mentioned that she was my ex. We, we divorced a year and a half ago. Um, and I went, came through it pretty well, but for, it took me probably a good, <clears throat> almost, the, almost a full year, not quite about 10 months before mm -hmm. like even 98% of the grief was gone. It wasn't all gone even then, but it was mostly that mostly gone. Yes. Right then. And yeah. it, it took me like eight months, nine months of it to realize that I was still in the grief. I thought I was past it in four or five. I even said so here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we do as as human beings is that we we want other people to see that we're okay. So we, because we we're conditioned to please others, because it's not about you. It's not about you. You know, get on with your life. It's not about you. That's how. That's how society is 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 brought up. That's how we all are, and or led to believe we should be. <clears throat> so when grief comes along, when we lose a loved one, we put ourselves last. Everybody else matters except us. We're okay. We're fine. So we live in this land of okay. I'm fine. Whoever you bump into, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm okay. Like your mother. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm doing well. Um, until you get into your own space, into your own, and then you crash and burn, really crash and burn. So it's this yo-yo between I'm okay and crash and burn. I'm okay, crash and burn. Mm -hmm. Now that can go on for years if you don't make the decision and the choice yes, to stop yes. that, that hamster wheel. And that's where the choice comes in. We choose how we live our life. We choose to be happy or we choose to be sad. It's, it, it, I know it sounds really simple. It's not that simple when you're living in that grief state because we're not thinking rationally. Well, just because you made the choice doesn't mean you're automatically there either. I think that's probably why we end up trapped like that. Yeah. I mean, we can take we can take a long time to make the decision, but then we make the decision, and it, it's not like the whole thing just goes away. Yeah. <laughs> you still have to actually work through it. <laughs> now the work begins. <laughs> now the work begins. <laughs> oh shoot! Yeah. I thought this was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got one of my beautiful clients who, who, every time we work together, when we leave, when she, when, when we, you know, when she says, you know, that's what's fantastic. I've, this has happened, this, that's happened. She says, but I've got a stomach ache again. <laughs> mm, <that's right. laughs> but I think, think there's a lot about other cultures, isn't there? Because, you know, that there's women who just wear black for the rest of their lives. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, certainly in the older days, it was perceived that you had to mourn for the long time or for the rest of your life. And even now when people are bereaved or widowed and they find another partner relatively quickly. There's a lot of judgment over it. So there's a lot of judgment around grief as well, isn't there? Being a widow, and this is what I didn't realise until I became a widow, is the most judged death that there is. Hmm. Because everybody looks at you while you've lost your husband. And it's so different to divorce because there was no choice. Nobody chose to leave. So it's a different level. So, and, and that's regardless of what the marriage was like before, because very often, I mean, I, I work with ladies that their husband, uh, they discovered after their, their husband passed away that, that they were having an affair. I've got one client that, that husband died overseas and she discovered he had a whole family with children overseas. Oh, wow. 
So, you know, there's, the, there's all this stuff that's, that, that's woven into the loss of a life partner, whether it's male, your woman, or widow, widow, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That bond is so misunderstood because people think, well, okay, you've lost your husband, just get on with it, move forward. So we, as a widowed person, think that we just, we can't show our emotions, we have to put on this brave face, we have to show our kids how strong we are. But what that does to us is that we don't move forward. You never get, you never get over the loss of, of, of a loved one, of a life partner. You never get over it. You, you don't even learn to live with it. You embrace that grief with love. A lot of my clients have found new partners and um, their first question to me is, I don't want to lose myself again in this relationship. And what I say to them, depending on who, who the new partner is, is that if it's a divorced person, they have to realise that they're in a threesome yeah. because your husband or your wife will always be in the background. Always, but they're not in competition with the other person. Because you take them with you wherever you go, because that was a, a loss that you, you, it was a loss. It was, they passed away. Mm. There was no anger. There might have been afterwards, but that, it, it's still very different. If, if I've got this beautiful client of mine that, that found love oh, about 12 months after her husband passed away and that was her goal because she had no children and she was in her late 60s Denise I don't want to die I don't die on my own she met a widower and the first thing she said to him is I'm happy to be in a foursome how about you <laughs> <laughs> I love that so it's realizing that the that partner will always be there that wife that husband that passed away will always be there because they've got children that have had a mother or a father that passed away so that person is always there but what so many people don't understand and that's why i say it's the most misunderstood death is the the loss of a partner is that they're not in competition Because the person, you know, like this client of mine, that the, the guy that she's with now is so different to her husband. Mm. So different to her husband. There's no comparison. And they're not looking to be replaced, are they? You're not looking no. to replace your partner. No. You not just want all. to add to the love. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but that again is a is a decision. It's a learning. It it, it takes a certain amount of personal uh, development and growth to actually get to that stage mm. it's not something that you just wake up in the morning and go oh well i'll just accept his wife or i'll just accept her husband it's it's a journey it's a journey into self into actually coming to that realization that hang on the love is different do you believe this is may get us into a little hot water but we do that all the time do you believe that Grief has to be deeply painful. No. Grief is love. Grief is love. When we, and I know you ask the hairy questions, I'll answer with a hairy answer. When we feel the pain, we're thinking of ourselves. It's actually quite selfish. Because we're putting ourselves first. We're not putting our loved one first. What would they want to do right now? Would they want to see me in the state of despair? Would they want to see me falling on the floor with a hundred bottles of wine around me, crying and grieving them and, 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 and walking around, not smiling? Would they want that for me? It's a great point. It's a great question. Yeah. Probably the last question on your mind when you're dealing with something like that is that one. <laughs> Absolutely, because it's all about me. We're the victim. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fair. Don't you realize? Don't you know? Look, look at me. Look, I, I, I've lost my husband or my wife or my child. Or Look at me. Don't you understand? Now, grief is a normal reaction to loss, any loss. It doesn't have to even be a death of anybody. Mm -hmm. You can grieve the loss of a job. It's true, sure. 
but it's misunderstood when it comes to the loss of a person it's like oh it's not fair why did this happen to me I had an 82 year old lady sit, sit across a coffee table with me one day and her husband had just passed away and she was crying you can imagine they'd spent all their life together she was crying she didn't know what she was going to do with the rest of her life and I looked at her and I said to her, what do you want to do? She said, I don't know, but why me? Why me? And my immediate answer was, why not you? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of brought her out, you know, well, why not me? Yeah. I, and she said, I don't know. And that was the beginning of her healing, her healing step. Sometimes we have to be shocked mm -hmm. out of that. That realization that, that that state that we get ourselves into we, we need somebody to shock us out of it and ask those difficult questions well why not you yeah and it's the only inevitable bit about life that we get surprised about yes yeah and and that's because we're not taught and we're not shown how to lose anything mm, it's true we're taught how to get stuff get people get babies have a baby get married yay celebrate 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 oh, i've got a new job and that's why i said you know grief is grief is across the board it's not just the loss of a, of a of a loved one but when we lose that thing or that person or whatever it is we don't know how to handle it because we're not taught how to handle loss what do i do now it's gone which is kind of an odd thing as i think about it and the reason I say that is we may not be taught it, but we certainly learn it really well. We can stay we can stay stuck in that for a long, long time, even though nobody ever taught us. Yeah, because we start we replay that movie of that loss over and over and over and over again, and that's the problem: is that that movie gets played, and you know we sit and we think about things, and then all of a sudden, boop, it pops into our head of how we lost that moment that person died, mm -hmm. how they died why they died, what that one said to you at the funeral, and that's a whole movie that you're re-watching again. And that's my, that's why traditional therapy doesn't work in the long term, because it's talk therapy. So you're forever talking about your, your, your what happened to you, why it's not working, how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. We have to break that cycle, draw a line in the mm -hmm. sand and say, okay, this happened. Yes, it was it was horrible. It was terrible. It was awful. But let's move you forward. Let You're bringing something to mind, which is uh, it's a story I have actually told previously on the on the program, um, but I hadn't thought about it in a while. It's what my ex uh, said to me. She, she, she was going through a thing where she had had a, a, state, a stepmother who had passed. And she was used to calling her stepmother uh, every Wednesday, like clockwork. And then all of a sudden, she couldn't do that anymore. And it wasn't it wasn't a, a surprise death. We, we knew it was coming. There was plenty of advance notice. She got to say goodbye, all that stuff. But afterwards, she found herself grieving the fact that she couldn't talk to her stepmother anymore, which, which by the way, is kind of odd because early on in their relationship, the relationship was terrible. It had mm -hmm. grown into a loving relationship over time. But at first, they were like fighting tooth and nail with each other. And they had turned that around over a period of years. Well. She got to a point where uh, she recognized what was going on. That's one thing when you're a therapist, you, you get training on how to look for this kind of stuff. And she, and she recognized what was going on. Um, and yet she was kind of feeling stuck in it, kind of along the lines of what we're talking about here. And there was one particular day where she was just, it was like, knocked, she was knocked on her back. She was just, she could, just could hardly even move. She could hardly bring herself to deal with anything. And I didn't know how to handle her. I didn't know how to help her. I didn't know what to do. So I, I, I did the only thing that I could think of to do. And I had no reason behind it. I had no thought process. It was just like, mm -hmm. I, I just want to be there for you. So she, we had one of these uh, sectional couch, uh, couches. And, and she would sit in the corner of the sectional. She had this whole area of, her, of the room scoped <laughs> out for herself, right? You know, so she was sitting in the, in the corner of the couch there. And for whatever reason, I decided to just go up in front of her and kneel in that little corner section of the couch and take a hand and say to her, tell me, you never really told me this before. Tell me what you love about Ruth. Ruth was the name, the name of the stepmother. And she had this look on her face like, well, that's a kind of an unusual thing to ask somebody. And she thought about it for a second. And then she started telling me all the things that she loved about Ruth. 
And within moments, her face was lighting up. She was feeling better. She was getting expressive, everything. And she said, you just figured out how to get through the five stages of grief. How did you do that? <laughs> because there are no five stages of grief and you don't wait for time. That is the biggest myth. Honestly, you know, you did so well, Walt, because I have, from the day that I was told to go through the five stages of grief and to wait for time by my therapist, I knew there was no ways I could go through the five stages of grief. What am I doing going through? I'm not angry. I'm not, I'm not in denial, you know, and it keeps people stuck because they go, well, what stage are you in now? And even my therapist said, oh, you're not in that stage yet. You can, and that's what takes time. Um, the five stages of grief were not meant to be used for people that had lost somebody, for anybody. It was meant for those diagnosed with a terminal illness. Mm. Now, there's a huge difference between being diagnosed with a terminal illness, yes, you are in denial. No, no way. No way is this happening. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. But when you lose somebody, there are no stages. It's just, as I said, everybody, it's higgledy-piggledy all over the place. And emotions, you cannot. You know, you're laughing one minute, you're crying the next, you're triggered the next because you hear a song. And it's, well, what stage is that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's the first thing. The first thing I want to say to anybody is stop trying to navigate the five stages of grief. And when you do that, time is time is time is an illusion. Does it matter how long you've lo you've been grieving? It doesn't matter. I had a beautiful lady that was only uh, two weeks into her grief journey. She, very well educated, school principal, um, married for many, many, many years. And he discovered that her, after, he, after her husband passed away, that um, her husband had frittered away all the money mm. on prostitutes. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Their credit card was racked up. There was debt everywhere. She was basically left with $4,000 of, which was her salary, which was her, her pay for the month coming up and she was so angry she really was i mean she was betrayed you'd be angry whether the person was had passed away or not sure. Sure. and um and she called me up we we had a chat she said to me do i is it too soon i said no never it's never too soon you've got a lot to unpack and um she said, because I want to grieve him. I loved him. Before I found this out, I loved him. And I want to love the man that I want to grieve for the man that I loved. Mm -hmm. And we started working together. So there's never any time that's too soon. Never any time. And she was able to forgive him and love him and started feeling her grief. You know, she, as she said, I love the man. It's only what I found out afterwards about him. Mm -hmm. So it's never too soon. Don't wait for time. Time does nothing. Time is just an illusion. It's numbers on a clock. What is it going to do for you? It just ticks away and it eats away at you. That did used to baffle me when people were like, no, you have you have to wait six months until you can have bereavement counselling. And it was like, surely you need that at the beginning as well. Yeah. Why do you have to wait for a particular period before then? Okay, you can officially grieve now. Like, I just never yeah. got that. And, and and I love the way you said you can officially do this and officially do that. And this is how people get stuck in their grief is because they feel guilty. Now, they're already feeling the guilt and the loss and everything in their grief. But then they get told by other people, oh, you're moving forward too fast. Slow down. Just slow down. There's no rationale, but why? Why? Why must I slow down? Mm -hmm. Why can I not embrace life again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it 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 it's a it's an absolute um, mess of misinformation that people are telling you of how to grieve. Then they say to you, "Oh, you need luck in the US. You guys have got grief share. We don't have it in Australia. I don't know about you, Anne Marie, whether you've got grief share, but it's no, it, it's an organisation that. that's run by the church where everybody sits around and shares their grief." It doesn't work. Yes, you're meeting other people that have lost others in their life, but you're listening to their sad stories. 
Yeah. And if you're How not feeling like you? that, yeah, if you're not feeling like that, you'd be like, is there something wrong with me? Do I not, did I not love them enough? Or it could be quite confusing, I imagine. What did I miss? What did I miss? Um, I've got a lovely client that <laughs> went to grief share five times. I don't think I've been on more than once, but I understand. <laughs> I, I just can't subject myself to that much pain. I mean, I, I suppose I could, but it, it's never been on my list of priorities. <laughs> and I said to her, I said to her after we had started working together, obviously we, we you know built a relationship. I said to her, "What part of the first time you went did you not understand that you had to go five times?" <laughs> And I get, I get it. We need to connect with others that are going through what we're going through. I get that part of it. But that's all it is, is connecting with them. It's the same as reading a book on grief. You're getting the information, but you're not getting the transformation. And you're getting somebody else's version of how they dealt with their grief. There's a phrase that pops up a lot in the kind of circles we're in here, people who talk about spirituality, law of attraction, all that kind of thing. Um, and it's a phrase that I've never liked the phrase itself because I thought it was a very misleading phrase, but it still crops up a lot. And, and the phrase is toxic positivity. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's my reaction. The reaction oh. you just had, that's my reaction. <laughs> And I realized ultimately why it was that I, I disliked it so much. It, the reason I dislike it is because it's a phrase that tries to claim that it's the positivity that's toxic. And it's not the positivity that's toxic. Yeah, it may be a t positivity that's trying to mask something else, but it's not the positivity that's toxic. It's the stuff that is trying to mask that's the toxic part. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, you know, you talk about the law of attraction is, it, is what we think we get without, without exception. So if, you, if you're sitting around in a group of people or you've joined a group or you're talking to people about loss and sadness, what is going to come to you? More loss and sadness. Yeah. We have to break that cycle. We have to start focusing on what we want, not what we don't want. Mm -hmm. That's right. And Where have I heard that before? <laughs> yeah, it comes up occasionally, doesn't it? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, but the first thing you, people say to you, say, if you ask somebody what do you want, well, I don't want to feel like this anymore. No, yes. no, no, no. What do you want? <laughs> See if you can express it without the word don't in the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same as grief. And that's why I do what I do. I don't work in grief. I really don't work in grief. I work in hope in life. Mm. I don't doubt. I don't even have to know your story. I don't want to know your story because the death of your loved one is what brought you to me. Mm -hmm. Now we go, okay, let's move you forward. Let's help you create that, that life. Find out who you are. Learn to love yourself. Watch how you talk to yourself. What are your thoughts? What are your patterns? What are your beliefs? Etc. Etc. So it's, it's a deep dive into you because what grief does is it puts a magnifying glass over our life. And it brings up all those emotions. And suddenly we see things we never, ever thought was even there. You're also bringing something else to mind. I had a conversation with, uh, there's a, a meetup group that I, I just joined over the last few months. And it's for people with spiritual orientations, talking about the kinds of things we talk about here on the show. Uh, and one of the things that happened, well, actually, the main thing that happened during the meeting we had on Saturday was we had a, a new member who had, uh, joined up. And at first he was talking like the whole thing was new to him. But then I realized fairly quickly in the conversation, it wasn't all new to him. He had heard all of the, the topics that Anne-Marie and I talk about here on the show, that other people in these circles talk. She, he understood the whole thing. He just couldn't come to grips with certain pieces of it. Yeah. I mean, he, he knew all the theory. He knew every single bit of the theory, but there were pieces he just couldn't, he couldn't work yeah. with. He didn't know how to navigate them. And so we talked about navigating them. And one of the things we talked about was there were, there were three, of, three of us who were male, one female in this conversation. The female, Heather, she, she at one point, we were, she was so quiet, we actually asked her, you know, 
what are you thinking over there? She says, I'm just sitting back and enjoying watching this male energy going back and forth, giving him exactly what he needs. <laughs> what was it that he needed? What he needed was to hear another male saying, it's okay for you to feel things. As a matter yes. of fact, we meals, we meals, yeah, we, well, we're meals too, but we males have this <laughs> tendency to, to just, you know, not allow ourselves to feel things. And what you're, you're reminding me of is this is not a merely male trait. Everyone <laughs> does this. Yeah. Everyone has this tendency to just believe like, I can't allow myself to feel things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember one of the things I vividly remember is that I was going through my process of learning that it was okay, not only okay to feel, it was essential to feel. Was, we have to feel. Oh, we have to. We have yeah. to. But I, one of the first things I, one of the biggest things I remember was the first time I allowed myself to just stay in a negative feeling. My fears had always been unstated, never brought to the surface, always un unconscious. But my fears had been that if I go into that, that fear state or that anger state or whatever that, that negative vibrational state was, I was going to stay there. I was shocked if I stayed there, how quickly it dissipated. I was I absolutely in stunned silence. Like yeah. that only took five minutes. That's not possible, is it? <laughs> and that's why my what my message is, is that grief doesn't define you. Grief doesn't keep you stuck there. Grief is just a moment in time. That loss is just a moment in time. And we pass through that. Now, how we pass through that is our choice. So we're back to the choice again. How we pass through that is our choice. And my the first letter in my flow method is feel. F for feel. When we when we don't feel, we don't know what we can let go of. That's the L. How do we overcome? That's the O and become whole if we don't start with the F with the feel. Mm. I remember when I started feeling my feelings, really allowing myself to feel my feelings. I would lock myself in in the in my walk-in robe, my walk-in cupboard. Imagine this, I'm sitting there in, the, in in an afternoon and suddenly I get this grief and we all know that feeling of the grief comes down. It's like a cloak, a black cloak that comes mm. down. And normally I would just cry or I'd sit there or I'd be miserable. But this particular day I thought, you know what, I need somewhere to go and process. It, it, was, just, it was just a subconscious thought. It wasn't, I didn't actively think of it. found myself walking into my walk-in robe. My little poodle Lulu is behind me sat down i actually sat down in the corner behind all my my dresses that were hanging up and i just started rocking mm. and i just started rocking i didn't realize at the time that i was feeling i just knew that this is what my body wanted this is what i needed and i let out a guttural scream it was like a primal scream from the pit of my stomach mm. i was in the dark Little Lulu's running around, Mummy, are you okay? I'll cuddle here. No, I'll cuddle there with you. Um, but it was after that, when I came out, I actually scared myself. The scream was so primal. And I could do that because I was living on eight acres, so nobody would hear me or think that I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it was socially appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, we still have that. Oh, I just screamed. Oh, it's okay. You're on eight acres. Nobody, nobody nobody's going to come knocking on the door. Are you okay? Um, but even in that moment, there's that fear of judgment, isn't there? But that's, totally. that's your body letting go of just yeah. what it's held on to. Yeah. Yeah. You see, it's all energy. And grief is a very slow, low moving vibration. So if you look at the the, the 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 spiral, you've got grief at the bottom and you've got joy at the top. Now we can't get from grief to joy in one in one foul soup. Oh, I just want to be joyful again. We have to go through the energy cycles, but we can do that within weeks. Within a week, it doesn't have to be within five years or ten years. It's what we do within that time. You know, wait for time. Okay. You know, it's like if you've got a if 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 you've got a flat tire and you're just waiting for it to pump itself up. It's not gonna pump itself up. You actually have to actually pump that tire. And patching the hole is probably a good idea too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I know from my own experience, like, is the first time I fully felt grief was just a shock because yeah. I've never felt it before and it I had to get help for that. Um, but having lost my mum nearly a year ago, that's been very much waves of grief because yeah. I think my my belief system in knowing that she's in a much better place with God just makes yeah. me feel so much better um, and that she will be free and happy. But also I think there's some beauty in the sadness because if you're feeling that sadness it's quite a beautiful emotion to me I've managed to learn, teach myself to actually um, appreciate it um, mm -hmm. but if you're sad it means you've had something if you're grieving you had something and how lucky were you to have it yeah and and that's and that's the love the grief is love you know mm -hmm. um, we also need to change our language around grief Everybody wants to heal their grief. Hmm. You can't. You can't heal your grief because it's love. How do you heal love? You know, um, I've been I've been trying to heal my grief for years now. Well, stop. Stop trying to heal your grief and start healing you. Truth bomb. Well, it actually raises <laughs> a question for me too. The question is, is grief love or is grief denying yourself love? It can be both because if you're grieving with sadness and you're grieving with um, pain and you're grieving with heartache and you're grieving the loss and you're focusing on that one moment of time that they, that they passed away, that's sadness. When you grieve with love, yeah, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Now you yeah, remember what a good... You know, you're remembering all the good times you had together and the laughs and the funny things, and you're not focusing on that one moment in time anymore. Yeah, that, that, that's why I think it worked when I, um, without realizing what I was doing, I <laughs> led myself, my, led my, my ex-wife through, what did you love about Ruth? And it changed the whole framework because now she was focusing on what she loved about her rather than the loss of her. Yeah, gratitude, gratitude, be grateful, mm -hmm. have a gratitude diary. It's the first thing I say to all my clients is, Start a gratitude diary. Be grateful for five, just five things every day. Mm. Now, I know, I know, and we all know, some days you wake up and say, Ugh, there's nothing to be grateful for, absolutely nothing. Today sucks, it's awful. But there is. Start with the little things. Oh, I had a cup of woke coffee up. this morning. I woke up, number one, I woke up. Um, I made myself a cup of tea or coffee. How grateful am I that I can have, that, that I have tea or coffee in the house? I have a bed to sleep on. So it's those things that start the gratitude. Because we only have two emotions, fear and love. Hmm. And Many ways it's true. Yeah. Underneath those come all the other emotions. Mm -hmm. So when we come from gratitude, we're coming from love. Because you can't be in fear and be in gratitude and be grateful for your life at the same time. It's just humanly impossible. You can, you, try. <laughs> you can try. You can try, but it's not going to work. <laughs> it's like you just do it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trying to laugh and cry at the same time. It just right. doesn't work. You're either laughing or you're crying. Or you're laughing so much that you are crying. But you <laughs> <laughs> so when we, when we come from, from gratitude, we're coming from a space of love. And that starts, like you did with your ex-wife, that starts that journey of changing the focus, shifting the focus mm -hmm. from that one moment of time to the life that you had. The shifting of yeah, focus is, is so easy to overlook. And the reason I'm thinking oh. about that right now is um, there's a situation that is going on with somebody in my life. Um, I Obviously, I haven't got any permission to tell her story, so I won't tell her story. But the gist of it is that she went through a traumatic event over uh, was over the weekend. No, it was on Friday. And as a result of that traumatic event, uh, she found herself saying to me, my, back, my bad luck streak is continuing. And she, she had a whole number of things that had gone wrong. And as soon as she said that, all I could think of was how the previous week she had told me about some massive victories that were going on in her life. 
that directly impacted me as well. I mean, because she's involved uh, with one of my businesses. Um, she had overlooked that entirely because yeah. when you're in that negative state, in that state of anger, grief, rage, frustration, whatever it might be, it's so far away from that positive vibration. We don't even remember it anymore. It's, it's not, not part of our awareness. It's not part of what we're thinking about. It's why it can be so difficult to move from a negative state to a positive state because it's so far away. And we just we forget about it. We forget that those things, I mean, they could have happened within a space of days of each other. But if we're in the negative space, all we can think about are the negative things. And that's why we come to the conclusion, I'm on this losing streak right now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's why it's so important to get the right help in moving forward. Healing you, not your grief. Um, I see so many beautiful people that are stuck. You know, I've got a, a, an amazing client who lost her daughter. Now, she already had three children and her husband and her decided they wanted to adopt a, some, a baby or a child from Liberia, which, as you know, is an African country. Mm. They didn't adopt one, they adopted three. Wow. So you can imagine the mix of the of the of the of the cultures, the American culture and the, 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 the Liberian culture. Sure. Her daughter grew up and in the teenage years she started having problems, she started acting out because what was her early conditioning? Was poverty, was war, was so in their wisdom the family said, Okay, you need to break to to, to be go away, go away to school. Go and the school was apparently the best on, that they could find. And find yourself. Find out who you are. Mm. Get the help you need. But she didn't. Instead, she died th at the school mm. through medical neglect. She got sick. Nobody got to her in time. Um, they dismissed what she was going through and she passed away. Wow. But what my client did was she embraced that as I'm not going to let her die in vain. Mm -hmm. And she started working with me and um, I've also got a, an academy where I teach you how to be a, a successful uh, flow transformational grief coach and she joined the academy. After she healed herself, she joined the academy. She is now helping other parents navigate the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. So, Amazing. yeah, where is the gift in grief? Where is the gift in the loss? She I'm never, sorry. she never, she, she never, felt, obviously, she felt the victim. It's not fair. Why did my daughter die? There was a whole court case around it. Um, it's, it's quite public, so I won't, I won't mention anything, but mm -hmm. there's even been a, um, there's a movie made of, 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 you know, of it, no. etc. Et so for her, um, you know, she said the movie's just been released now and she said she was triggered all over, but then she looked at this whole situation and she went, what a gift her daughter gave her to be able to help others. But what a gift for me to help her in the first place. So it's that decision, that choice. What am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with this loss? Well, it's also a perspective because that's what you were describing was her perspective and yours perspective. It's something yeah. I've talked about a lot here on the show. Anne Marie has heard me, heard me discuss perspective ad nauseum just because I just won't shut up about it. Um, <laughs> perspective, <laughs> but I've learned so much from the different perspectives of the guests on my show over the, yeah. you know, the 12 plus years that I've been doing the show. 13, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be 13 years in September. Yeah. And those perspectives are invaluable. I mean, I've learned more from those perspectives than almost anything else I can think of in my life. Yeah, so, yeah. so having different perspectives, well, first of all, that to me is if you want to move off of a spot that you're on, that's your best way to move off a spot. Understand yeah. it from somebody else's perspective. That'll move you real quick, yeah, especially absolutely. if it's a perspective you disagree with. That's even more powerful. It'll piss you off, but it'll definitely move you. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. You know, um, grief is not a death sentence for you. The loss of a loved one or whatever it is, even if it's the loss of a job. That's why you know I said loss of job, loss of a promotion. Loss of a friend. You can have a friend that decides to eh, ghost you. I don't want to be your friend anymore. And you have all those 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 emotions. So 
Um, and especially now in the last three, four years, grief is everywhere. The whole world is grieving. The whole world is grieving. You know, so it's, as you said, it's a perspective. How do you see things? And we see things as we are. We, no, we have no other way of seeing them. So we see them from our perspective, our beliefs, our programming, our conditioning, mm -hmm. our culture. Sure. And then somebody else comes with a different, different perspective, different culture, and we go, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> There's no such thing as right and wrong. It just is. That's yeah. your perspective. That's my perspective. Let's meet in the middle some way. Yeah, well, actually, that's one of the biggest things I learned along the way was how useless morality is. I, I, I was always very, very tied up with morality for a large portion of my life. Yeah. And it took me years to realize I was killing myself with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was strangling myself. I had no clue that I was doing it. And it wasn't until I replaced any time now, whenever I find myself uh, encountering a question of right versus wrong, I have learned to rephrase it as like versus dislike. Just so yeah. I can take that power out of it. Yeah. That's yeah. the most liberating things I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Because now I, I don't even think of it in terms. I mean, there certainly there are things I don't like. There are things that I like, just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. But because I've labeled it like and dislike versus right and wrong, it, it doesn't have power over me anymore. That's I have right. power over it, but it doesn't have any power over me. And and that, that that's such a great way of being because we when we when we label it as right or wrong. That's how our, why our world is in war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's be, let's be Isn't honest. that an odd thing? The one thing that morality is, <laughs> because morality is all about trying to get other people to live a particular way so that you'll feel better, and it leads to war. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's, you know, to bring that back to grief again is, am I moving forward too fast? That amount of times, I could be a multimillionaire by the amount of times that my clients, when we start working together, am I moving too fast? Mm. Is it wrong? Is it wrong that I didn't cry? Yeah. Well, let's get to the bottom of why you're not crying. It's not wrong. It just just is. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of one client in particular. I've been, you know, she's she's now become quite a good friend of mine, and as most of my clients do. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> even though we're all around the world. <laughs> um, she said to me the other day. She said to me, she said, Denise, she said. I still don't cry. And I said to her, when you do cry, those floodgates are going to open up and you're just going to, it's just going to come out of you because it's energy, it's suppressed energy. And um, she watched some Hallmark movie about something, I don't know, some <laughs> Hallmark movie. And she said, you know, that I've cried and I cried. I've never cried at a movie in my life before. <laughs> and I said, yeah, because that, those emotions will come out eventually. Don't force them. Don't try and go, well, this is right, this is wrong, I didn't cry. And everybody's saying to you, oh, you've got to cry. Why? Why do you need to cry? If you're not a crier or you're somebody that's never cried throughout your life, there's a reason why you haven't. There's something that you're suppressing on a deep subconscious level. And you're not going to get to that just because your loved one passes away. It's okay. Don't cry then. Yeah, I can I can feel certainly in my experience that I've, I started, I'm obviously getting teary because it's coming back to my mum's anniversary. But there was times where it's like I couldn't cry. I cried lots. I'm OK. I'm not OK. And now I'm teary. And I listened to like I was literally yesterday listening to songs, as you said. I you know, can't listen yeah. to those anymore. I just went, you know, it's it's just your rave. And I just. The, the the emotion and how much better you feel once you've had that cry you have to how feel it feel better. yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's not just you it's everybody we have to feel it you know you can be even me it's been 15 years since my husband passed away and the other day i'm driving along the, the motorway and um a song comes on And I just had tears streaming down my face and I burst out laughing and I went, oh, man, what are you doing to me? Fifteen years <laughs> later. <laughs> and that's why you never heal the grief. You cannot heal that grief. And it's okay if 15 years, 20 years, 30 years later to still have that emotion. 
but feel it. Let it come up. What we do is we go, oh, my goodness, it's been 15 years. I shouldn't be feeling like this. It yeah, puts, it puts that's in the right there, the word shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't be feeling like this. And then other people are saying, wow, it's been how long and, and you're still feeling like that? You shouldn't be like that. You need help. You're not broken. No. You're no not broken. I saw it. I, I've been uh, subscribing lately to uh, Gaia TV. I had never really watched it before. I but, love uh, Gaia. I love yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. I've been watching that and in, some interesting stuff. Some of the stuff I, I could leave behind, but some of it's really, really, really good. Um, but I, I saw this one person giving a talk at a conference someplace, and she was talking about aliens and, and how, she, how she's been able to contact aliens from this particular place and so forth. And she made a really interesting observation. She says, she learned something from the aliens that kind of surprised her. What she learned was that alien species are absolutely in awe of humans. Yeah. That we're the most powerful people in the universe. Yeah. And she says, how can that possibly be? <laughs> we're not that powerful. <laughs> how could that be? And, and the answer came, to, came back to her. It's because you can do something that the rest of the universe can't do. You can feel. Yes. You can express emotion. You can feel huge emotion. You're incredibly powerful. How do you do that? And yeah. and mainly that dense energy is what they're envying. Mm. Yeah. 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 So we have to feel, we have to go down that, that, that deep pit of grief because if we don't go down there, we can't let it go. And when we mask it and we pretend we're okay, guess what? It comes around and bites you in the backside. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're it, we're good at that. <laughs> Highly skilled, certified. <laughs> Got the T-shirt, sold it, bought another one. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. It's like, why is this happening to me again? Because you haven't dealt with it in the first place. The universe has a great sense of humor. <laughs> you didn't learn this the first time we're just going to give it to you now in bucket loads here we go now you can feel it all over but you know what i'm going to give you a little bit more spicy this time <laughs> <laughs> which also means it's like a little bit of a of a sarcastic side to the sense of humor as well <laughs> like we're, yeah. we're not just going to give it to you we're going to give it to you with a twist <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to eh, give it to you, just that little bit extra. You know, it's like when I started working with people in grief. I didn't want to work with people in grief. I was a bookkeeper, tax agent when my husband passed away. Wow, there, there's a transition right there. It's unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. And um, after I started healing myself and everything, everybody said to me, you know, Denise, why don't you work with people in grief? And I said, no, oh, I've been there. no way, no way. <laughs> And I kept getting bumping into people that I didn't even know. I hadn't seen for a long time. And I go, how are you going? Oh, good. This is what I did. Da, da, da. And I'd go, why are you working in bookkeeping and doing what you're doing? Why aren't you helping people in grief? Oh, well, you know, and then, of course, the story started. You know, I don't, I'm not, don't, I don't want to do that. I healed myself. I don't want to go down there. Until one morning I woke up and it was just like, wham. Okay, universe, you want me to work with people with grief? Show me. There, there are many people who come onto the program talking about their topic, whatever it is, and they describe it as a calling. You're describing it more like a, I was dragged into. I was totally <laughs> dragged into it, which has now become my mission. It's almost like I'm, you know, you know, you see this. I'm on a mission now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, you know, and and when you when you started, you said, you know, as a little girl, I didn't grow up thinking when, and going, well, when I grow up, I'm going to become this person that's going to help everybody through their grief. Yeah. It was never, ever. I was I was going to be a ballet teacher. That's because I was right. doing ballet at that stage. Right. Sure. That was my life. I'm going to be a ballet teacher. And here I am teaching people and helping people through the worst part of their life, the hardest part, mm -hmm. and how to come out the other end. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very important, no doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. As so often happens when we have these conversations, I look up the clock and I say, wow, that went fast. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the time go? Time really is an illusion. It's just gone. <laughs> I just looked up there too and I was like, good grief. 
<laughs> good grief. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> good grief. <laughs> good grief. Excuse the pun. <laughs> so, yeah. So once again, it has, you know, life has proven to me, the universe has proven to me that time really is an illusion because it just flew right past. Yeah. Um, but before we uh, wrap up for today, there are a couple things that we need to, to you know, a little housekeeping things we have to do. First and foremost, for someone who does want to reach out to you, how do they find you? The best place is my website, which is flowgriefacademy.com. Um, I've got the link, I've got links in there. I've got videos. I've got so much on there that they can get hold of me. They can book a call with me. Mm -hmm. I like to have a, a call, a free, I offer a free one hour call, mm -hmm. um, where we just go through, where are you in your grief journey? Why, you know, are you ready to move forward? Because you have to be ready. You have to be ready to do the inner work because it is work. We, as I said earlier, we roll up our sleeves together and we, 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 we move you through what's keeping you stuck. We don't talk you through it because we cannot talk our way through it. We have to take action. Try as we might. Just, I'd love to. I'd love to wake up tomorrow after waiting for time and go, whoa, look what happened to me overnight. That's, it doesn't work that way. That's magical thinking. <laughs> um, so we have that conversation first, and the link is on my, um, on my website. Um, I also ha have a, a podcast as well. Also, the link is there. So the best place is my is my website, uh, flowgriefacademy.com. All right, very good. Then the second thing that we do, there's, there's three pieces of housekeeping we have to do at the end. This is the second one. The second thing that we do is something that I started about two years ago because, I, I mean, I've had all these guests. Anne-Marie's been a part of a lot of them. A lot, all these guests coming out of the program, all these people with these different stories. They go through some sort of dark night of the soul. They come out with, at the other end. They have some sort of amazing thing they learn from it. They want to share it with the world. So they come out of the podcast to talk about it. And it's wonderful. Uh, and not just on this podcast. They go on to other podcasts. They, they write books about it. They create courses about it. They post stuff on social media. They're writing blogs. I mean, they're doing all this stuff, putting all this stuff out there. And lots of people are consuming it. They never find out about what happened with them, but there are people getting benefited from it. And it occurred to me, we don't get credit for that part too much. In fact, we don't get credit for it at all, for the fact that there are all these people who are consuming this stuff that we never meet, we never see. And yeah. we don't even find out that we help them. We do. We just never find out about it. And we never get credit. We never get thanked for it. So I like to make it a practice to say, Denise, on behalf of those people you've never met and never seen, never yeah. will meet, never will see, who you've been helping in all these different ways, thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing because you're yeah. making a difference in this world. Yeah. yeah no, you're so welcome. Um, I, I do have, you know, I've got a, a, a Facebook group, which is oh, close to 8,000 people in it. And some days it's just crickets in the group. And I think, mm, nobody's commenting or anything. And then suddenly somebody will book a call with me. And they've been in the group maybe for four years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to anybody else out there, carry on doing what you're doing, even if you're getting no response, because somebody is hearing you, somebody is listening, and you just have to be one person, one life that you say. Yeah, it happens every single day. It yeah. took me a while to learn that about doing this program, because like I said, I've been doing it for 12, going on 13 years. Yeah. and. I, for the long, well, first of all, for the first few years, I didn't know I had any listeners. That was kind of a shock when I found out I had listeners. When I found out that I had listeners, then it's like, oh my God, what have I been saying? And, you know, I just have to have like an awareness of it. I got to be really careful what I'm saying on this program. But over time, what I learned was I actually am helping people when I don't realize I'm helping people. Yes. My guests are helping people when they don't realize they're helping them. We're talking about things that are, was, are being said at exactly the right time because there was somebody who needed to hear that. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. that takes a while to kind of get used to that, to kind of it accept does. it's true. But it we, we, we think we're talking into the abyss and there's nobody there. You know, sometimes I go into my group and I go, hello, 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 is there anybody there? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, this time. <laughs> <laughs> but then out of the blue, boop, so you, diary, oh, somebody's booked a call with me, they enroll in the program and their life is saved. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have been in there for four years, yeah. five years. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's not about, and again, it's not about me. It's about, or about us. It's about who we are helping and who we are talking to. And sometimes we do find out, which is really cool. I found that out with Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie was a, a listener for a long time and then she became a co-host. And that was, that was a revelation. It was wonderful. Yeah. And it has yeah. lasted for a few years. It's been great. Yeah. 
but that yeah. also leads me to the third thing that we do every time that we, we finish up a show because I make it the point to have my co-hosts summarize what it is that they think is the big takeaway from the show. You see Emery's getting herself geared up as I'm so I'll give you a little time. Emery's to up. Okay, she's getting warmed up. She's getting out her, her warm up uniform. She's ready to go. Like, wow, okay, let's go. <laughs> No pressure. no pressure. I think I was I was just going to add on to what you said because I, I, I said to you earlier in the fact that tomorrow, this morning I was having a few tears of grief of my own and then I saw that you were coming on the show and I was like, okay, obviously I'm meant to be here. <laughs> I'm meant to listen to this and it was very therapeutic. So thank you very much. I think some of the main points that came out was there is no right way. There is no wrong way if it's for you. Yeah. And just feel what you need to feel and don't feel bad about not feeling bad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's when guilt creeps in. Why am I not yeah. feeling bad? Why am... Or another big one is comparison. Mm. Yes. Just feel what you need to feel. It's mm -hmm. all you need don't to focus on. Don't compare your grief. To... And that's why I absolutely have a pet hate for grief groups on Facebook. Mm. They are a cesspool of, of, of victims. And I say that with absolute love. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is why my, my group sometimes goes a bit quiet because I don't allow anybody to share and keep sharing their sad story. Mm. Because what that does is you share this is where, what I did and this is how I'm feeling. And then you have a hundred other people give you their opinion and how they're feeling. It doesn't help. Well, it does help if you want to reinforce the pain. That's right. It's, it's great for absolutely. that. I mean, if, if, if you really wanted to do it, I'm not saying that's a wonderful thing to do. I'm just saying that would, that would be very effective. <laughs> it, it's very effective because yeah. everybody goes in and says how sad they are, but they, and it becomes this little bit of competition. Hang on, hang on, mm. hang on. You don't know what I'm going through. I went through something that's a little bit worse than yours. And then somebody goes, oh, that's what, oh, I would hate. And it, it, it's just, it, it's, it's toxic. It becomes a toxic environment. So anybody out there that's listening Whoever you are, get out of your negative, toxic grief group. It's a remember. competition you don't want to win, isn't it? That's right. It is an absolute competition you don't want to win. You want to be in an environment that's that, that's loving, that's uplifting, that people are sharing their, their, their wins, their, their stories, their how, how yes, they fell down, but how did you get up again? I don't remember where this comes from, but I, I remember a few years back, this was a, a kind of a thing. It, was, it may have come from a comedy routine. I'm not quite sure where it comes from, but it would, the, the basic routine would go like this. You know, we were so poor when we were growing up, we lived in a shoebox. And the other person says, you had a shoebox? Oh, I would have tried <laughs> to have a shoebox. We couldn't even afford a shoebox. And you know, it so it becomes this ongoing concept. I can top that. <laughs> It's exactly what a great, a great, a great way to, to to look at it because it's like, but you don't understand, you know. Um, and everybody grieves in their own way. It's a loss. It doesn't matter how you got to the stage in your life. Was it tragic? Was it murder? Was it suicide? The end result is that now, where's the gift? What are you going to do to move forward? Where's your gift? Thank you for the gift, Denise. Yeah, you're Thank so you. welcome. So yeah. welcome. And I know there are lots of people who, who are going to listen to, to this episode and say the same thing. So I, I'm saying it on, on their behalf. Thank you. you. You gave a great yeah. gift. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Anne Marie, I just want to want to acknowledge you for being here, even though you you've got had this coming up for you. And um, I've noticed a change in your physiology. Your eyes are yeah. shining more, and you you're more. Um, even your skin tone, everything has changed from when we started to where you are now. So you've had a shift. So, Oh, I've definitely had a shift. And I will say it has turned from daytime to nighttime, but I have. I do, feel, too, but yeah. <laughs> I do feel a lot lighter and, yeah, yeah, a lot warmer. So thank you very much because if you hit one person, you've hit me. Yeah, fantastic. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So thanks for joining us, Denise, and uh, thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.